Hello and welcome to Escape Rooms I'd Love To But. Before we start, let me introduce us all as a group. We are Susan, Sylvia, Gordon and Lorna and we are a group of educators from different disciplines across two universities in Aberdeen. Our mutual interest in pedagogical escape rooms led us to meet regularly in order to discuss contextualised practice and encourage each other to learn from our diverse experiences. Something that we definitely have in common as a group is dedication and an absolute passion for escape rooms. Just think that I personally got locked into my work on a Saturday night while extremely focused on designing an escape room. I was so focused that I lost track of time. For this presentation, we have drawn from our personal experiences, setting up and running escape rooms with a range of disciplines and cohorts to identify practical issues to tease out together. These range from what software can be used to designing simple escape rooms based around identified learning objectives, while considering the practicalities of running this successfully, both in person and online. We will also address the importance of debriefing as an integral part of the escape room process, as well as the importance of ensuring we uphold inclusive pedagogical approaches. By sharing what we've learned so far while developing, delivering and evaluating pedagogical escape rooms, we hope to encourage others to embark on their own escape room journeys, knowing that rocky routes are often the most rewarding. To start off, Susan will tell us about software that you can use to design your escape rooms. In this section, I will outline the criteria for choosing software to host your escape room. Then briefly summarise how PowerPoint, Microsoft Forms and OneNote can be used to facilitate escape rooms. The first point I'd like to make is that you should use software that you're already familiar with to build your escape room. It will save time and stress if you use software that you're already accustomed to and it will be easier and less nerve wracking if something goes wrong. My second general point is that the software that you use doesn't have to be fancy. You don't need an all singing, all dancing interactive escape room to engage students and achieve your learning outcomes. It's the story and the task that draw participants into the escape room, not the technology. Basically, all you need is software that will show the questions and prevent participants from progressing unless they have the correct answers. The last general point I'd like to, you to consider is how you will share the software with your students. As a group, we've all had problems with our escape rooms becoming inaccessible to students due to the university's firewall or upgrades to the software. As you can imagine, this is super stressful. So a top tip is to get a student and colleagues to check the link before the event to make sure that your file shares properly. I'm sure PowerPoint is familiar to many of you, so I'm going to show you how a slide can be turned into a simple escape room. On a slide, use a suitable picture for your escape room as a background. Then add pictures to the background picture. Use the right hand button on your mouse when you're hovering over the picture to add a hyperlink to the picture. The hyperlink can be to documents that can give clues, questions or tasks, or it can take students to online puzzles such as jigsaws. Microsoft Forms and Google Forms are a simple way to make an escape room. Set up your question, then switch the required button on so that the students need to get the correct answer before they move on. Making each question a new section means that the next question is only displayed after the correct answer has been given to the previous question. 
text, images and videos can be integrated into the form, both as ways to make the task more varied and to add the escape room narrative and atmosphere. Lastly, the sections on OneNote can be passworded, making it suitable for creating escape rooms. OneNote allows audio, video and files to be embedded in its pages, so a notebook can display the narrative, questions, clues and puzzles. For all the software that I've discussed, there are a myriad of video tutorials and templates on the internet to guide you through the process of setting up an escape room. Software is not a reason for not making your own escape room. Start basic and once you're feeling more te technically adventurous, you can develop more complex escape rooms with free software that allows more professional results. Now Sylvia will talk about designing your escape room. Now that you have an idea of software that you can use to develop your escape rooms, we can think about design. The choice of software is obviously part of your design, but I will bypass these as Susan already gave you a great overview of the available options. Also bear in mind that your escape rooms might be fully physical, in which case you don't need software at all. This said, let's have a look at the steps I suggest you take to design your very own pedagogical escape rooms. So you start by thinking about your players, so your students. What level are they at? Are they undergraduate, postgraduate, first year, final year? Do you know them at all? Is there a degree online? Is there a degree in person? Is there a module online or in person? Once you have these answers, you want to think about numbers. Do you have a large or a small cohort of students? How long do you have for the session? Finally, clearly define what you want to achieve with the escape room and what your intended learning outcomes are. Let's see what I really mean by looking at an example. I recently designed an escape room for a small cohort of undergraduate stage two students. These were applied bioscience students attending an in-person 15 credit module on biochemistry. The class only has seven students, so a very small cohort, and I know they engage much better in person. I taught these students biochemistry for two months, so the escape room was actually their final two-hour session where I hoped to help them integrating all the biochemical pathways that we had seen together. Given my players, my numbers and my aims, I designed an escape room on, um, online on Genially but delivered that in person and I had a mixture of physical and online puzzles. Students played in small teams, four students and three students, but ideally I would always recommend you have a maximum of five students per team. Four to five players is ideal. Duration of the escape room should normally not exceed one hour in my experience. However, in this case, I gave students 75 minutes because they had quite a bit of reading to do for this particular escape room. The remaining time will obviously be essential for a proper debriefing session, so always factor that in. If you had a bigger class, you might want to think about delivering the escape room fully online, setting breakout rooms, having facilitators, and that's just because managing physical resources, space and noise can really be daunting if you have a very large cohort. Once you have defined the technicalities of your escape room, you can let the fun begin. And this is when you come up with the title, the narrative and the puzzles to match your intended learning outcomes. I usually take care of the narrative and the title first before coming up with the puzzles, but you can most certainly do the opposite. But the top tip here is let artificial intelligence help you because it can. Let's look at an example. Here are my title and narrative for the escape room I mentioned earlier as an example. Feel free to pause the presentation and have a good read through. 
In this escape room, students had to escape a cell in which they had been trapped by Dr. Metabolicus. And because the escape room was designed around the intricacies of metabolic, metabolic pathways and metabolic integration, I called it Escape the Biochemical Maze. While artificial intelligence gave me the backbone for this title and narrative, the final result is far from what artificial intelligence had suggested. Puzzle design is the fun part, but also possibly the most challenging part. Puzzles must be designed to address intended learning outcomes, of course, and ideally you want some variety. There isn't a fixed number of puzzles that you must achieve, but you don't want to include too many, I would say. You don't want your students to get frustrated. This is where you need some creativity, but again, you can seek help from AI. Artificial intelligence, in my experience, is not great at coming up with puzzles that are challenging enough for higher education. However, it gives you a great starting point. Examples of puzzles that you can freely create online are scattered throughout this presentation. However, I'm going to now show you a couple of examples of a physical and an online puzzle that I included in Escape the Biochemical Maze. In this slide, you can see an example of a physical puzzle. This physical room or the physical room in which I run the escape room contained a number of physical elements, some of which were just distractors. And amongst these, students could find the metabolic map, which you can see here in the top figure. And this was drawn on PowerPoint, so very low tech. It was mostly blanked, printed and laminated. And then in the same room, I had a bag containing labels for this map, blue tack, a few pens, including a UV pen. In their instructions, students were told that to succeed, they had to use what seemed like waste using their bright minds. Overall, for this puzzle, students had to fill in the metabolic map until they were left with two labels on which a message had been hidden using a UV pen. And you can see that message in the bottom figure. The message was their key to get out of this room. Here instead, we have an example of a very simple online puzzle. For this one, I wanted students to come up with the word sugar. So the rebus here hints at the song Sugar by Maroon 5, which was a major hit in 2014. To avoid frustration among my students, I integrated hints to automatically pop up after a certain amount of time. So after five minutes, students could listen to um, a little bit of the song. And after a further five minutes, they got access to these rebus as well. Now, if you don't want to prepare hints in advance, what you can do and what I often do is offer my students a certain number of lifelines. So I tell them, for example, that they can ask me for help on two occasions throughout the escape room. Where possible, something that I always try to include in my escape rooms is a talk to me or time to talk puzzle. I usually set this halfway through the escape room. And this is usually designed around a case study or a problem solving question. And the students have to tell me, actually speak to me, to tell me their answer to get the key, which is usually well done. This allows me to safely interact with them, check where they're at, um, check if they're working well as a group, without making them feel I'm constantly checking on them or staring as they're working through the puzzles. Once you're happy with your design, there are only three things left to do. You need to test your escape rooms first and foremost. So you need to test it yourself and ideally send it to someone else as well. I always send it to my husband and a colleague. After testing, make the necessary amendments and repeat this step as many times as needed until you're happy with your end product. At this point, you can think more carefully about facilitation, and if you're going to need facilitators, you might need to write a facilitator guide or provide some training. Last but not least, think about evaluation and debriefing, two aspects that are key to a successful escape room and that Gordon is going to tell us more about.
Now we come to debriefing and evaluation. Using an escape room as a learning and teaching experience is part of the experiential learning cycle where we've created a concrete experience for students to engage in an active experiment. Through having time to debrief and to evaluate with students, this provides an opportunity to make connections. It provides an opportunity to identify if students have been able to take away the key learning gains which were anticipated at the beginning of the escape room. Through this experience, it provides an opportunity to return to the overarching learning intentions. And through that, it gives an opportunity to unpick any pupil misconception and address any key learnings which have emerged from the engagement in the escape room. As a result, this generates conversation to identify how the learning from the escape room impacts not only their engagement in the course, but wider learning goals for the remainder of the experience as well. So in relation to inclusive pedagogy, the good news is that escape rooms, by their very nature, are inclusive. There's limited access issues, whether this is in person or online. Um, different puzzles can be designed or are designed to suit different ways of working, different learners. And there's often limited pressure because escape rooms are designed to be experiential and playful. Collaboration itself is also by very nature inclusive. And within escape rooms, different skills and perspectives are looked for as beneficial. The Carnegie Mellon University in the US um, did some research on this and actually found that um, teams with diverse strangers were most successful in um, escape rooms. And ultimately, your design can be based around your players. Know your learners, as Sylvia has already suggested, and adapt puzzles and context as required in order to suit the people that you're working with. So when designing an inclusive escape room, ensure your context is inclusive of diverse cultures and backgrounds. Think about your own group dynamics, who should go with who. Be aware that some people are less digitally native than others if doing this online. This might be a time to allow some people to explore the materials independently, possibly after the event. Balance competition with intended learning purpose. Sometimes you need a timer, sometimes you don't. And as Sylvia said, you can provide additional clues as and when required and ensure there is easy access to the games master. Or alternatively, allow your students to lead the learning by designing tasks for each other. And remember, escape rooms don't just talk about inclusive practice. They actually require teams to demonstrate it. Taking it all together now, as I'm sure you gathered from this presentation, we are really passionate about the use of escape rooms in education and we do everything we can to share this passion with others. We are always met with enthusiasm, yet we also often hear colleagues telling us, escape rooms, yeah, they're good, I'd love to use them, but we find that there is often a preconception when it comes to escape rooms, with some educators thinking that escape rooms are difficult and extremely time consuming to create, while others just see them as a bit of fun with no academic value. If you're one of these educators, we truly hope that this presentation convinced you otherwise and gave you all the information to confidently get started. Creating escape rooms can indeed take time, but as with everything, the more you create, the less time it takes. And also bear in mind that once you have created one, you can reuse it and also repurpose it if needed. Also, you don't need to do it all yourself. Join together with colleagues and, for example, make one puzzle each. We can guarantee that the end result will be extremely rewarding for you and your students. If there is any question that you still have or would like some assistant getting started, 
please feel free to reach out. Our email addresses are on slide two and we would love to hear from you. Thank you very much for listening and bye for now.